Okay, we finished the host system requirements. Now 2.3, building LFS in stages. LFS is designed to be built in one session. That is, the instructions assume that the system will not be shut down during the process. That does not mean that the system has to be done in one sitting. The issue is that certain procedures have to be reaccomplished after a reboot if resuming LFS at different points. So procedures have to be reaccomplished. So do we have any updates? So uh, no. So we can just hibernate the system, I guess. <laughs> I'm assuming that would be okay. All right, 2.3.1, chapters 1 through 4. These chapters are accomplished on the host system. And uh, if you want to know what this host system is, we just go to the About, and you'll see I'm using Ubuntu 2004 LTS. Um but it has the low latency kernel from the Ubuntu Studio. Okay, so um, these chapters one to four on the host system. When restarting, be careful of the following. Procedures done as the root user after section 2.4 need to have the LFS environment variable set for the root user. Okay, procedures done as the root user after section 2.4 need to have the LFS environment variable set for the root user. All right, 2.3.2, .2, chapters 5 and 6. The mount LFS partition must be mounted. So the mount LFS partition, these two chapters must be done as user. Chapters 5 and 6 must be done as user LFS. A SU-LFS needs to be done before any task in these chapters. Failing to do that, you are at risk of installing packages to the host and potentially rendering it unusable. Okay, that's kind of serious. Well, it's a good thing I'm using this uh, newly installed Ubuntu. Um, so the mount LFS must be mounted in chapters 5 and 6, and a SU LFS needs to be done before any task. SU is super user, right? But it says the two chapters must be done as user LFS. All right, well, we'll see. The procedures in general compilation instructions are critical. If there is any doubt about installing a package, ensure any previously expanded tarballs are removed then re-extract the, the package files and complete all instructions in that section. The general compilation instructions. Where is this? When building packages, there are several assumptions made within the instructions. Several packages are patched before compilation. During the compilation, there will be several warnings that scroll on the screen. Check one last time that the LFS environment variable is set up properly. Echo uh, 
string LFS. Make sure the output shows the path to the LFS partitions mount point forward slash MNT forward slash LFS using our example. Finally, two important items must be emphasized. The build instructions assume the host system requirements, including symbolic links, have been set properly. Bash is the shell in use. SH is a symbolic link to bash. User bin awk is the symbolic link to gawk. User bin yacc is a symbolic link to bison or a small script that executes bison. Place all the sources and patches in a directory that will be accessible from the Chirut environment, such as mount LFS sources. Change to the sources directory. For each package, use the tar program. Extract the, pack, extract the package to be built. In chapter 5 and 6, ensure you are the LFS user when extracting the package. All methods to get the source code tree being built in position, except extracting the package tarball, are not supported. Notably, using cp-r to copy the source code tree somewhere else can destroy links and timestamps in the sources tree and cause building failure. Change the directory created when the package was extracted. File the book's instructions for building the package. Change back to the sources directory. Delete the extracted source directory unless other, uh, in the instructed otherwise. So for the procedures that we just read are critical. If there is any doubt about installing a package, ensure any previously expanded tarballs are removed. Then re-extract the package files and complete all instructions in that section. 2.3.3 oh. uh, Chapter 7 through 10 The MNT LFS partition must be mounted. A few operations from changing ownership to entering the chroot environment, chroot, must be done as the root user. With the LFS environment variable set for the root user, when entering chroot, the LFS environment variable must be set for root. The LFS variable is not used afterwards. The virtual file systems must be mounted. This can be done before or after entering chroot by changing to a host virtual terminal and, as root, running the commands in section 7.3.2, mounting and populating, slash dev, and section 7.3.3, Mounting Virtual Kernel File Systems. Okay, that was Building LFS in Stages. <coughs> 2.4, Creating a New Partition. Now, if you look on my YouTube, I did several videos. If you look at my channel, um on FDisk, CFDisk, and SFDisk. And I read Linux partitioning in MX, Debian, Ubuntu, Manjaro, Arch, Gentoo, and LFS guides here. I'll probably link these two videos in the description of this one if you want to look at that. Also, I showed you what I did to set up this Linux um, operate this Ubuntu system that I'm using now. I don't know why this is red in Vivaldi up at the top here. All right, creating a new partition. Like most other operating systems, 
LFS is usually installed on a dedicated partition. The recommended approach to building an LFS system is to use an available empty partition or if you have enough unpartitioned space to create one. A minimal system requires a partition of around 10 gigabytes. This is enough to store all the source tarballs and compile the packages. However, if the LFS system is intended to be the primary Linux system, additional software will, will probably be installed, which will re require additional space. A 30 gigabyte partition is a reasonable size to provide for growth. The LFS system itself will not take up this much room. A large portion of this requirement is to provide sufficient free temporary storage as well as for adding additional capabilities after LFS is complete. Additionally, compiling packages can require a lot of disk space which will be reclaimed after the package is installed. Because there is not always enough random access memory RAM, available for compilation processes, it's a good idea to use a small disk partition as swap space. This is used by the kernel to store seldom used data and leave more memory available for active processes. The swap partition for an LFS system can be the same as the one used by the host system in which case it is not necessary to create another one. Start a disk partitioning program such as cfdisk or fdisk with a command line option naming the hard disk on which the new partition will be created, for example dev sda for the primary disk drive. Create a Linux native partition and a swap partition if needed. If you do not yet know how to use these programs, refer to CFDisk8 or FDisk8. So in other words, let's see. Um, man 8 CF uh, disk. Um, display or manipulate a disk partition table. And if you do um, man f disk, insert eight in between there, manipulate disk partition table. Oh, Q to quit. If you do not yet know how, for experienced users, other partitioning schemes are possible. The new LFS system can be on software RAID or on an LVM logical volume. However, some of these options require an Anitra MFS, which is an advanced topic. These partitioning methodologies are not recommended for first-time LFS users. Remember the designation of the new partition, e.g. SDA5. This book will refer to this as the LFS partition. Also remember the designation of the swap partition. These names will be needed later for the etc fstab file. So if I go into disks, on this, I will build the LFS on this file system. So it will be built on the dev sdc2 system. I imagine I can always delete it later even though this logical partition here would make more sense. And I also have a swap partition. Um, so the 
Dev SDC two is X EXT four. And the swap partition is dev on my system SDC six. And that is the partition type swap. Okay, so that's the plan. Okay, so those names, dev SDC two and dev SDC six will be needed later for the etc. FS tab file. 2.4.1, other partition issues. Requests for advice on system partitioning are often posted on the LFS mailing list. This is a highly subjective topic. The default for most distributions is to use the entire drive with the exception of one small swap partition. This is not optimal for LFS for several reasons. It reduces flexibility, makes sharing of data across multiple distributions or LFS builds more difficult, makes backups more time consuming, and can waste this space through inefficient allocation of file system structures. 2.4.1.1, the root partition. A root LFS partition, not to be confused with the slash root directory, of 20 gigabytes is a good compromise for most systems. It provides enough space to build LFS and most of BLFS, but is small enough so that multiple partitions can be easily created for experimentation. The swap partition. Most distributions automatically create a swap partition. Generally, the recommended size of the swap partition is about twice the amount of physical RAM. However, this is rarely needed. If disk space is limited, you also need uh, the swap, I think, for hibernation. If disk space is limited, hold the swap partition to 2 gigabytes and monitor the amount of disk swapping. If you want to use the hibernation feature, suspend a disk of Linux, it writes out the contents of RAM to the swap partition before turning off the machine. In, the case, in this case, the size of the swap partition should be at least as large as the system's installed RAM. Swapping is never good for mechanical hard drives you can generally tell if a system is swapping by just listening to disk activity and observing how the system reacts to commands. For an SSD drive, you will not be able to hear swapping, but you can tell how much swap space is being used by the top or free programs. Use of an SSD drive for a swap partition should be avoided if possible. The first reaction to swapping should be to check for an unreasonable command, such as trying to edit a 5 gigabyte file. If swiping becomes a normal occurrence, the best solution is to purchase more RAM for your system. The Grub BIOS Partition If the boot disk has been partitioned with a GUID partition table, GPT, then a small, typically one megabyte partition must be created if it does not already exist. This partition is not formatted, but must be available for Grub to use during installation of the bootloader. This partition will normally be labeled BIOS boot if using FDisk or have a code EF02 if using GDisk. The Grub BIOS partition must be on the drive that the BIOS uses to boot the system. This is not necessarily the same drive where the LFS root partition is located. Disks on a system may use different partition table types. The requirement for this partition depends only on the partition table type of the boot disk. Let's see, disks. Yep, 
Yeah, I don't know if there's that one. Um, that small, what did they say? One megabyte partition. I don't know if this doesn't say if it's there. Okay, so they say that I have to have a one megabyte partition. But if we do sudo fdisk dash L, enter, then if you look up here, it, the first section is the EFI system. Then I have two blank uh, file systems. Um, I forgot what I made SDC for, but SDC5 is my home. Um, and SDC6 is the swap. So I have a problem here where it says typically one megabyte. I probably need to look that up. Um, this is an EFI file system. Hmm. Two... Uh, Let's see, the requirement depends only on the part The Grub BIOS partition must be on the drive that the BIOS uses to boot the system. This is not necessarily the same drive where the LFS root partition is located. Disks on a system may use different partition table types. The requirement for this partition depends only on the partition table type of the boot disk. 2.4.1.4. Sorry about the noise. There are several other partitions that are not required, but should be considered when designing a disk layout. The following list is not comprehensive, but is meant as a guide. Slash boot, highly recommended. Use this partition to store kernels and other booting information. To minimize potential boot problems with larger disks, Make this the first physical partition on your first disk drive. A partition size of 200 megabytes is quite adequate. Slash home, highly recommended. Share your home directory and user customization across multiple distributions or LFS builds. The size is generally fairly large and depends on available disk space. Slash USR. In LFS, slash bin, slash lib, and slash sbin are sim links to their counterpart in USR. So USR contains all binaries needed for the system to run. For LFS, a separate partition for user is normally not needed. If you need it anyway, you should make a partition large enough to fit all programs and libraries in the system. The root partition can be very small, maybe just one gigabyte in this configuration. So it's suitable for a thin client or diskless workstation where USR is mounted from a remote server. However, you should take care that, that an Initra MFS, not covered by LFS, will be needed to boot a system with separate uh, with a separate user parti partition. Opt. This directory is most useful for BLFS where multiple installations of large packages like GNOME or KDE can be installed without embedding the files in the user hierarchy. If used, 5 to 10 gigabytes is generally adequate. TMP. A separate TMP directory is rare but useful in configuring a thin, a thin client. This partition, if used, will usually not need to exceed a couple of gigabytes. USR SRC. This partition is very useful for providing a location to store BLFS source files and share them across LFS builds. 
It can also be used as a location for building BLFS packages. A reasonably large partition of 30 to 50 gigabytes allows plenty of room. Any separate partition that you want automatically mounted upon boot needs to be specified in the ETC FS tab. Details about how to specify partitions will be discussed in section 10.2, creating the ETC FS tab file. All right, I'll continue this, Lord willing, in the next video.